Fiji Geeks, episode 220, May 4th, 2009, May, May 6th, 2019. What am I doing? I don't know. I'm, it's it's I, Revenge of the Sixth. <laughs> it's Revenge of the Sixth, yes. <laughs> uh, anyway, on with the show. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com, where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery, sci-fi, comics, film, horror genre, you name it, we talk about it. I'm Keith Lane, and we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely Phoenix, Arizona, where it's crazy for the episode to break down so early mm. on. <laughs> Yes, and I'm Ben Raginton, and I've got absolutely nothing to add to that little mayhem here in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, because we're actually we're we're, we're recording this on uh, Star Wars Day, May fourth, so that and and it's also Free Comic Book Day. And I just you got, were working on an I article got for that. Confused. You were working on a May the fourth article, so yeah, you, yeah. you had a little bit of time like, dilation there. Holy I guess. moly! Anyway, we're <laughs> let's get on with this show. Prepare for hyperdrive. Meanwhile, in the Hall of Episodes, the two gay geeks are discussing this. Well, we have an author, Michael G. Williams, and I intended to say something about that, uh, flying cities and, and robots and and whatnot. Uh, and then oh, got, my. <laughs> oh, my. And I, I got derailed. So we're going to talk to Michael about his book, A Fall in Autumn. And we have our birthday shout outs, as usual, and our featured podcast of the week. And then we have some feedback, as always. Thank you to everybody that uh, contributes to that feedback. And then we have in our second segment, a little event that we went to for Arizona Filmmakers. And the weekly recap, as well as our follow-up items. Please don't tune out when we get to the follow-up items. There's some really important stuff that we talk about, some upcoming events and stuff that you may want to check out. So we're going to get right to talking to Michael. And this time we have author, speculative fiction author, Michael G. Williams, and he has a new book out. And welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. lovely to be here. So tell us about who is Michael G. Williams and how did you get into the uh, writing speculative fiction? Uh, I, that covers a wide genre, but so you <laughs> you know a wide area of writing but it's uh, like the almighty umbrella exactly so so tell right. us who you are and and how you got into writing about this so i am a native of north carolina I was born here and have lived here my whole life i moved to a different part of north carolina because i grew up in a very remote place in i don't know i'll call it a culture that was hostile <laughs> and uh, I decided to get out and find some place with sidewalks and, uh, and you know, live in a place where there are other people. And that's uh, what I've done. I do information security, uh, computer security kind of stuff as my day job. And I have been writing since yeah, I started writing. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, in, I tried writing my first book in third grade. So oh, wow. it, was, it was not very good. You know, I can't claim it was uh, a very developed work. Hey, kudos but, to ambition, you know. Oh, that's that's cool. <laughs> right. And I wrote my first novel length work purely for my own entertainment probably 15 years ago. And then seven years ago, got basically on a dare, uh, I entered one of those novels that I had written. I'd written several novels at that point purely for my own enjoyment and had a couple of friends who had read them. And they were encouraging me to write more, but nobody said you should try to do something with this. And so I like, 
in 2012, entered one of those novels in a jury literary award contest and won, much to my surprise, and I think probably much to the surprise of all the other people who entered with their, you know, very serious novels about straight people getting divorced. And I uh, won with a novel about a gay vampire from the 1940s who lives in modern-day suburbia, and they uh, that really kicked me off, and I decided, okay... If those people liked it, then I'll see if I can publish it and uh, sell it to 10 strangers. And that was the beginning of my writing career. And now I have multiple series and multiple books coming out this year, and most of them are coming out from Falstaff Books. Wow, that's that's incredible. So um, the newest book that you have right now, the one that was just released a, a couple of months ago, was A Fall in Autumn. and. I can't. The fall of autumn. Fall, fall. fall in autumn. Oh, fall, fall, fall in, in autumn. autumn. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know why uh, I got that title wrong. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I can't remember how I came across that book. Were you featured in on uh, Queer Sci-Fi? Or... I was, yeah. It, it's, yeah. Was, was it one of the giveaways that they did for a month? or? No, I, I posted about it there on one of their Me, Me Mondays. And then... Uh, Jay Scott, whose last name uh, Coats, I've just forgotten. Coats, Coatsworth. We're going to talk to him in a couple of weeks. So, okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, he uh, posted about it um, after one of their reviewers read it and posted a review. Of hmm, it. Interesting. I, yeah, because it may have been through that that I actually found out about it. But anyway, I found it, and it was like when I started reading it, it I I was – immersed immediately um i i enjoyed the book tremendously um well thank you and it, it just it fit who i was and and how it you know it, it just i what can i say <laughs> I, I liked it and i liked the whole aspect of you know the different reality shall we say and and that whole different universe that what we live in uh, it was just yeah. it was wonderful. Well, thank you. It it, uh, it came from a tabletop RPG that is called Microscope. Uh -huh. and Microscope is this small uh, RPG. It's just one book. It's not you know like D and D where it's where there's fifteen different editions and each one of them has a hundred different books. It's just one book. You can buy a PDF of it on DriveThroughRPG.com, and it's not actually an RPG. It's a game about RPGs. Oh. And so the, the point of the game is to get together and create a world, create a setting. Wow. Sounds, so, oh, so it's like a it, sim. Sort of. It, it, you play it like a tabletop RPG in that, you know, four or five friends and I sat around a table together. But the rules of the game are that you sort of take turns establishing facts about the world that you're building together. And you take turns asking questions about that world. And sometimes you just answer the question as a group. But sometimes you say, I want to answer this question by role-playing a scene. And then somebody says, okay, well, then I'll be the scientist. And somebody else says, I'll be the archaeologist. And somebody else says, I'll be the guy from the future. And somebody else says, I'll be the queen. And then you figure out what the question is that you're trying to answer with that scene. And then you dive in and improv a scene with no system, no DM, no nothing. And you go until you've answered that question. Wow. And over the course of the game, you build this world, you build this setting. It's incredibly free form and very unstructured, very creative game that really calls on the players to get to be both sides of the table, you know, as the player and the GM. And all of us in my gaming group that played it have GM'd for each other. We're all very comfortable with both sides of that. And we're all very creative people. And so we had a tremendous amount of fun creating this world that was, we decided, you know, 12 or 13,000 years in the future and society, our society had long since collapsed and, and disappeared into the dust of history. Then this is the society that rises after us and they sort of think that they're the apex of human civilization. And in some ways they are and in some ways they aren't. And, you know, and we had all these details about, you know, the sort of stratified society and flying cities and things. And at the end of that game, we played two sessions to build this world. And at the end of that game, I said, okay, I need it in writing for everybody. 
that it's okay for me to write a novel here <laughs> because this is really a fascinating setting and I would really love to explore it and to get to like develop it further. And there's a lot that has changed about that world uh, as it is presented in autumn, in a fallen autumn. But that's where the, the seed for that idea came from. And I really, really loved writing in that setting with these characters, getting to talk about the issues that they're facing in their lives but I feel like make a great opportunity to talk about the issues that we face in our lives. Right. Well, I think that answers one of my questions, because one of the things that I noticed is, uh, when I read it is that this is probably the most... Uh, I'm going to use a word that could come off wrong, and it's not meant to, but uh, is in terms of world-building, I have never seen or haven't read a story that was this dense since Dune. Uh, I, well, I was really just like... Oh my God! Uh, I mean, there's just so many facets and details to everything that is going on as part of this universe that our protagonist lives in, and I, I was like, rather, um, not over. I, I was uh, insanely impressed. Well, thank you. I'm now covered in goosebumps. Because <laughs> uh, and I'll just be riding that around for the rest of the day. Um, but I, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of talking about like the world and the forces in that culture when we were playing that game. And then over the course of working with Falstaff to publish this book, I wrote the book. I wrote a first draft that ended completely differently and was really bad. And, uh, but I saved like the first half of that or so and said, okay, this is something that I can work with. And I came back to it a year and a half ago or so and started reworking the text and like rewrote it and added a lot more detail to the world, did a lot more of that world building work. So like by that point, before I had even talked to a publisher about it, it had been, it was in the third phase of, of building that world. Wow. I love the term world building because I think it's fascinating. It's one of my favorite things about science fiction. Right. So, uh, then when I showed it to Falstaff, they were already publishing some books from me, and we were talking about a second series, and uh, they said yes to this sort of sight unseen. And I, it was you know a situation where John, the, the owner of Falstaff, the publisher, said, you know, I trust you that this is going to be a good book, so yes, let's go with it. And if it does well, we'll talk about more. And and I just last week signed a contract to do four more books in this setting. So, oh, cool. So there we go. Uh, but he, uh, the, over the course of working with my editor at Falstaff, Erin Penn, who is fantastic. She is so amazing. Um, she did a lot of asking really deep questions about the world and about the culture that he's in and the rules of that culture so that it would remain consistent throughout. And uh, without her, I think the world building would be tremendously weaker. You know, but she asked so many really good, thoughtful questions that really challenged me to make sure that I kept things together right. from you know beginning to end. Well, that that's part of what draws me into some books, it, uh, and it it kind of I don't want this to sound wrong either, but at at the first it kind of frustrated me because <laughs> we we were getting all <laughs> there was we I was getting all this information. And then it's like, where is this going and what's happening? You know, <laughs> it's like the, you were giving enough little nuggets along the way, but then there was all this world building, which I like, but, you know, it. I'm one of those that I kind of have a love-hate. You need hate. a story. <laughs> I, need, I have a love-hate <laughs> relationship with it in that it's like, I love all the world building, but I hate to slog through it. You know, I just want to know it. <laughs> oh yeah. There is, you know, years ago I read this great post, you know, somewhere on the internet about somebody writing a scene of somebody getting off an airplane and, and like getting through the airport and out to a taxi and to their hotel, but writing it as though it were in a science fiction novel. So that every moment of it has to be radically over explained. Right. And, how, and, it, and it's really funny as a concept. And I really hate that sort of science fiction. Like in some ways I'm fascinated by that sort of science fiction. And in some ways I'm very frustrated by that sort of science fiction. So 
That I also this will sound really out of nowhere, but I am also a huge fan of James Bond movies and of the X Files. And one of the reasons why I love both of those is you get, always get a cold open. You know, you always in the X Files like you see a scene happen that you would not otherwise have seen because Mulder and Scully are not there yet. And you watch something happen with absolutely no context around it. You know, somebody gets abducted, the monster shows up and eats them, whatever. <laughs> right. And you, you kind of you kind of get to set the stage that way. And in James Bond movies, you always see James Bond at the end of his last case first. And so you have no context. You have no idea who these people are that he's chasing around. And, uh, I, and I've always loved that because I love the way that it just throws you in. Right. I like science fiction settings that are kind of a puzzle that have to be solved. Right. And especially in a detective novel like this, I wanted there to be a sense of there is so much more going on than is obviously apparent. And because uh, that's a part of the detective experience. Exactly. And, and that was that was what kind of let me be OK with all of that is that it is a detective novel. And, you know, and one of our favorite films is Clue mm. uh, or no, uh, no, Murder, murder, murder by, by Death, Murder by Death, Murder by where, Death, where he oh, says, on the great. very last page, you know, <laughs> it's right. like, so I was I was OK because. I know that there are clues to be revealed and it will be revealed in time. We hope, you know, in most cases. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was okay with that. It was just like, and and then it, it, it so totally drew me in. It's like, I can't stop. I have to read. (laughs) So I just, I'm very flattered. Thank you. Yeah. I I loved the book. tremendously. Something else that uh, made me smile as I was reading it, is the, the there, there's something very noirish yes. about oh, yeah. about the narrative in all of this. I mean, I I could almost hear that that cliche. It was a dark and stormy night, you know, kind of thing. Uh, Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> obviously that was, was going yeah, yeah. Obviously that was that was part of the intent. I mean, you were going for a noirish detective sci-fi, which is is a real um, genre bender in my head. Yeah. Oh, but it, but mean, it's... I, like I wanted to write something that I, I'm not going to claim that it's as good as this, but I wanted to write something that could feel like it happened in the world of Blade Runner. Uh, ah, I, I see that. Uh, yeah, I, see I, that. I, yeah. I see that too. Yeah, that that's great. Uh, so we've been talking about the book. Tell us and tell our listeners what is a fall in autumn. What is the the book about? And, you know, what you can tell us anyway without giving no anything away. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. No spoilers. And that's why I'm trying to uh, – I'm talking around everything here because <laughs> – Yeah, fair enough. Let, let the author handle it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, you can't trust me to do that. I told you the whole story once already. Um, <laughs> but uh, so the story is – it is 12,000 years in the future. Like I said, humanity has a, a totally different culture now. Now – they think of us, you know, the we who are alive now, as sort of their Atlantis. You know, they're not really sure that we existed. They have a lot of stories about us, and those stories mostly revolve around how we destroyed ourselves through hubris. So they're pretty sure that's cautionary tales, and maybe they should not take that seriously. You know, because they're, they have ridiculous legends about us, things like we went to space, you know, stuff like that. That's impossible, obviously. So yeah. they don't believe any of that. Um, they don't really have the same technological basis as we do. They don't use as much mineral-based technology like silicone and wires. They have some of that, and that's you know commonplace in their culture. But their great technological achievement is genetic engineering. So the main character, Valerius Bakum, is a detective. He is also what's called an artisanal human or an arty. He he's called that because his parents made him the old-fashioned way. He is an unmodified human. He was not genetically engineered before birth, and he has not been genetically modified after. And in his culture, they are treated special, quote-unquote. There are sort of religious restrictions around what is or is not available to him. So as a kid, he lived on a genetic preserve, which was a remote place that was very rural, and he had very limited access to technology and very limited access to medicine, things like that, because a lot of their medicine is based on you know genetic modification, gene therapies, things like that. 
there's you know sort of a 20 percent of his society that are called pluses and they're the people who are genetically engineered to be superior and then everybody else is you know either a more or less unmodified human who has you know a couple of upgrades or they are a human animal hybrid who has been designed sort of literally designed for some sort of specific task you know, right. so they're like manual labor manies and things like that. Right. Valerius uh, lives in the last of the great flying cities. His, you know, the the world has you know people in it and cities on the land, you know, and like normal places, normal boundaries, things like that. But at some point in the time between us and Valerius, uh, culture created a fleet of flying cities, and Autumn is the last of those cities. And, you know, his culture doesn't really understand how they work, but they seem to work just fine on their own. So he and another million or so people live in this great flying city, and he's a private eye. And that's how he gets by in the world. And a lot of people look down on him for being an, an arty uh, and think of him as sort of being a, an embarrassment. You know, he's kind of the, in their minds, he's sort of the, like, embarrassing uncle at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, some people really sort of, put him on a pedestal as being quote unquote pure as a human, but they have, you know, in their own way, they have restricted his access to things. And this is about him working what he expects for various reasons. This will probably be his last case. And uh, what his culture calls a golem, but we would call an android, uh, walks into his office and hires him for a job that he thinks is probably impossible, but it'll pay the rent. Right. And that's the rest of the novel. And that was that's fascinating. And you talked about the the manis, and and that was the the unusual thing is right at the very beginning of, of the open of the the book, and he's chasing a you know a what is it rhinoceros hybrid something or other. Yeah. It's like right. what the heck is this? <laughs> and yeah. then then and you go on to explain it, you know, and it's like oh, but it but it takes you almost a whole chapter to. <laughs> Until you explain that. <laughs> yeah, you know, this was written as a memoir that, that Valerius is making right. of his last days. And he uh, he doesn't need to explain those things to the people who would read it. Right. You know, because he's writing it for people who live in his world. So he doesn't need to explain that there are manies. He just needs to tell you what kind of manies he's run into. Right. And. One of my favorite reviews of it came from a, a site called Book Nerds Brain Candy. And that person, I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them other than that they try to stay anonymous and they write fantastic book reviews of really fun speculative fiction. And they actually posted their review of it. And it started with, I still don't like science fiction, but I liked this. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and their their objection was, like, they don't like having the world explains to them sort of one fact at a time for, you know, three chapters before things get going. And at the same time, they were frustrated in much the same way you were, so much the same way you were, because they wanted more information, more context around what was happening. And they were like, I don't understand what any of this stuff is. But, you know, eventually they were able to piece it together. Yeah, and and that and I didn't mean that to be a, a negative oh, no. because I mean that type of thing when it works really draws me into the rest of the story. There are some books that I have read that are just overwhelming in, you know, just I, I won't say info dump, but it just <laughs> it frustrates me to the point that it's like what is the point in reading any more mm -hmm. of this? But yeah, that was my problem with Doom. you. Gave, yeah. You gave just enough, a little bit, and and the intrigue. That's kind of what piqued my interest. You know, almost at the very beginning, and then I said, "Well, what the hell is going on? I need to find out. You know, what what he's doing, or why why is this happening? You know, right? <laughs> so that <laughs> that was the good part. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> one, one thing that I got to ask, um, now of course, this book is written in the first person, but I always yeah. ask this of authors because I find this to be just a fascinating psychological study. Uh, how fully formed is the characters, are, are the characters in your head? Because I, has, has it reached a point where they start dictating the story to you? Like I just, I was just uh, looking at something on Facebook from a, another author friend of ours. Who had just we just finished writing this story, and then his chief character said, "Nope, nope, it's got to go this other way," 
and he had to scrap like the last several chapters because his chief character in his head is saying, no, the story needs to be told this way. So has that happened? I mean, where, where your protagonist or any other characters are going, eh, eh, no, that's not working. Absolutely. Uh, when I start a book, I have, I almost always write in first person. I have a series coming out later this year that's written in third person. But uh, it's, that was a stretch for me because I originally started writing as a role-playing exercise. So I tend to very much inhabit the character while I'm, the, the perspective character while I'm writing the story and, and really like, tr- and basically playing them in front of everybody else who's reading it. So uh, I was a performance studies major in college. So I'm like really comfortable with the idea of like a one man show and things like that. And did plenty of them, you know, none of that uh, bothers me. It's all very familiar to me. And so that's sort of my writing process too. I figure out my perspective character and the world, and then I just start playing them on the page and we see what happens. Uh, but so I would say that at the beginning of a book, I know them reasonably well. At the beginning of the book, I have an idea of who they are and they're sort of a friend of a friend. And then by the end of a book, they are totally in charge. And I have just sort of had to let go and, and let them do their thing. And in fact, there are multiple moments in this novel that as I was writing it, in every stage, there were times when Valeria surprised me. There oh. were times when he really, he would say something or, or you know, the words would come out of my fingertips and I would see them on the screen and think, oh God, that is so him. Ah, that's <laughs> not what's supposed to happen right now. Uh-huh. You know, and, uh, and I think that that's what, I think a lot of writers experience that. You know, I have seen some writers address thinking of it that way or phrasing it that way as being amateurish or childish or somehow inaccurate. No. You know, and their, their deal is, I'm in charge at all times. And no. my deal is, yeah, I don't, I, I think that, I think that that says more about the person making that claim than it does about me. Yeah, right. the, the because, best, yeah, the best books that we have read from different authors are always the kind where the character takes control. And the yeah. author is merely the vehicle, or as I like to say, the author is merely taking dictation to what the character yeah. is saying to them, whether it's just one or two or however many. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And in a lot of ways, I was just taking dictation by the end. Right. There, I mean, there are bits of the last page that surprised me. Wow. There, are, there were things that were supposed to happen on the last page that didn't, and things that were not supposed to happen that did. And when I wrote the last line, then I said to myself, well, Valerius, you win. <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. that's right. Well, I, I I have to say I cannot wait for the next book. I cannot wait to see where this goes. Uh, so because... one of the things that I'm most excited about with the rest of the series is that they are not all sequels. There are two sequels that are set at later points in time in autumn. They're gonna the series will be called Tales of Autumn, and two of them are prequels. And oh. so I'm gonna get to tell a story of like Valerius when he's just starting out as a detective. And uh, the very last book, if all goes according to plan, is going to be about Valerius when he's a kid on the streets of Autumn. Oh, wow. Interesting. That would be fun. I, I I really enjoyed the book, and, and I wish we had more time to talk about yeah, this. We're, yeah, we're, but we're running out. We're of, running out of time, so let's, okay, just, let's just ask this. Where can people learn more about you? Any social media presence or website that people can go to to find out more about uh, you and what you are working on? Sure. So if you want to keep up with me in great detail, my monthly newsletter, which is a microfiction mailing list, I have an ongoing science fiction story set in the world of autumn, but set in our time when our society is collapsing. Interesting. Uh, that, that I post as a monthly newsletter. And so if you go to bit.ly, uh, B-I-T dot L-Y slash M-G-W newsletter, then that'll take you to me. Or you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash Michael G. Williams author, but the M, G, W, and A are capitalized. Or you can find me on Twitter or Instagram as at McManlyPants. Uh, and you can also find me on Goodreads at some unbelievably lengthy URL. 
<laughs> right. um, and, uh, you know, you can always email me too at Michael G Williams at gmail.com. And it's, uh, where is the book available? Is it available on Amazon? Uh, yep. It's on Amazon. You can also go to falstaffbooks.com and there are links there. If you want to get a paperback copy direct from the publisher, you can do that or you can buy paperback or Kindle or do Kindle unlimited, uh, through Amazon. Cool. Well, and all of my writing is about queer characters and queer stories. In a lot of ways, The Fallen Autumn is an explicitly queer story, and everything I write is. Well, that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, thank you for being on the show with us this yes. time. Yes. Oh, thank you. Oh, and my blog. Uh, my, sorry, everybody has like 14 social media. Right. Michael G. <laughs> Michael G. Williams-author.com. All right. Very good. Well, thank and you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so good. I'm writer director Joe Ahern, and you're listening to The Two Gay Geeks. How appropriate for that Joe Ahern bumper, because that movie keeps coming up on our hits. I know. B&B just continues to to make its rounds, uh, or at least our our review of the film. some of yeah. our other stuff. Yeah, so it's great. And here's a few selected birthdays for May 6th through May 12th, 2019. May 6th, Sigmund Freud. Oh, seems to be the yes, and Orson Welles, Willie Mays. Say hey. And Andri- Adriana Casolotti. And you, you probably don't recognize the name, no. but she was the voice of Snow White. Oh. Okay. And Rudolph Valentino and good friend Mr. Brian Brown. Oh, we just saw birthday. him the night. Yeah. We were at a an event at uh, the Technorama Studios uh, on Friday night. May 7th, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Johannes Brahms, Darren McGavin, and Edwin H. Land. Edwin H. Land was the founder of the Polaroid Corporation. Ah. He also created the Land Camera, which was uh, instant camera, and did a, a lot of work with the Department of, uh, well, the military to uh, work on far t- taking photos at distances on optics and like uh, telephoto. Yeah, telephoto. And uh, he's just a, an inventor in general. So happy birthday to Edwin H. Land, who has uh, changed photography forever, I suppose. Also, uh, friends of ours, Daniel DeGrado, who is a uh, film director, and Beth Accomando, who is uh, with KPBS in uh, San Diego, and Kevin Harmeyer. May 8th, Don Rickles. Stephen Amell, Roberto Rossellini, Tom of Finland. I know that his as opposed to be as opposed to Tom of Holland. Yes, but I'm bump. But I'm bump. Yeah, <laughs> where where is it? Oh, it, <laughs> well, you got other music playing <laughs> anyway. Um, but Tom of Finland had, was uh, known for his artwork, and it was uh, somewhat racy, but it, very important in the LGBT or the the gay community. Uh, and uh, from the 70s all the way up through the, the 90s and early 2000s. Also on May 8th, Ricky Nelson and Eric Choate. May 9th, Albert Finney. Interesting that we should, uh, his birthday should pop up. We've been watching the, the Poirot series. With David and, Suchet, but yeah, I've always, but, you know, Finney has always, well, man, I'm, I'm hard pressed. Who's yeah. my favorite? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I really, really love the way Finney plays. Uh, well, let's, let's put it this way: in the movies, Albert Finney. Yeah, and in the <laughs> in, in, on television, it's David Suchet. There we go. <laughs> also, May 9th, Rosario Dawson, Billy Joel, Howard Carter, who was the first to plunder an Egyptian tomb, and and Sophie von Otter, who is an opera singer. May 10th, Fred Astaire. David O. Selznick and Gary Owens. He, he was oh my a, God. the a voice, voice of like Hollywood Squares and new name the, the TV shows, yeah, TV game shows. He also had he was the announcer. Oh, laughing, laughing. That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, and also Bono and good friend of ours, Kevin Marshall. May eleventh, Richard Feynman celebrated a, a physicist Martha Graham. Martha Graham. Martha Graham. Martha Graham. Yes. 
and Salvador Dali and Irving Berlin, who, if if it weren't for Irving Berlin, we wouldn't have White Christmas anywhere. No, we wouldn't. But um, yeah, no White Christmas is anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. No, just White Christmas anywhere. Oh, oh. huh, huh. I thought we were all dreaming of white Christmases. Uh, well, yeah, we are. Anyway, not me, you know. No. <laughs> That's for sure. That's why we live in Phoenix. <laughs> exactly. Also on May 11th, a good friend of ours, Susan Echeverry, who makes a wonderful Sazerac uh, cocktail. I, we well, I sampled a tiny, that. tiny bit. Oh, my, and my Lord. My face almost turned inside out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> May 12th, Rami Malek. Catherine Hepburn, George Carlin, who we would not not even know some of those naughty words. Oh, without seven dirty George words. Collins, nope. or George Carlin, and Florence Nightingale, Burt Bacharach, and Steve Winwood, who actually made a name for himself uh, in his solo career. But I didn't realize he had such a such a pedigree. I mean, oh, he yeah. played with everybody. Oh yeah, uh, before he had his solo career, and Yogi Berra. Gabriel Faure, who is a noted composer, and Mary Kay Ash and her pink Cadillacs. She's uh, Mary Kay Cosmetics. Aha! And Jules Massenet, who uh, wrote several operas, and good friend Tim Callender. Happy birthday, Tim. And that's it for the birthdays this time. This is Barbara Dillon, one of the co-hosts of Fanbase Press's flagship podcast, The Fanbase Weekly. During the Fanbase Weekly podcast, the co-hosts and I discuss the top geek news stories of the week. In each episode, we are joined by special guests from all across the pop culture spectrum to get their take on what's happening in geekdom. Past guests have included Jeffrey Thorne, writer of Leverage and the Librarians, DC All Access's Jason Inman, Debbie Lynn Smith of Chimera Press, Xena Warrior Princess executive producer Stephen L. Sears, Ashley V. Robinson of Geek History Lessons, and many, many more. Join us for an episode of the podcast that celebrates fandoms on a weekly basis. A new episode of the Fanbase Weekly is released every Monday. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or look for the podcast at fanbasepress.com. Go give a listen to Barbara and Bryant Dillon over at Fanbase Weekly. And now it's time for what time is it? Time for you to play with the mixer again? No. I'm not going to play with the mixer. It's time for feedback. So this is uh, the feedback section where we kind of go over the comments that people left uh, on various areas of social media oh, and our comments. website. So starting off with the shipment selected to show at Tribeca Film Festival. This was a press release that we ran on our website. Got a comment from Shikart Public Relations. They say, thank you, TG Geeks, for the pre-announcement of Bobby Bela's epic sci-fi short selected at the Tribeca Film Festival. And then they went on to say, an exclusive podcast interview is coming soon in TG Squared Studio. Stay tuned. And that was episode 217. Then, moving on, uh, this is in regards to a little review we did for the Phoenix Film Festival, their sci-fi shorts. Got a comment from Boone Cavender, who was the director of the short Beautiful Bunkers. And Boone writes, thanks for drawing attention to the sci-fi shorts. And uh, I think, Keith, you added a little comment to that, saying, you know, it's one of the things that we look forward to most when we go to these festivals. Absolutely, yeah. Then we got uh, a comment. This is in regards to it was press release and mini review for the documentary General Magic, which will be in theaters on May 10th. We got a comment from on Twitter, General Magic themselves, and they said, thanks for the lovely review, guys. Made us so happy. Well, <laughs> thank you for making a lovely documentary. I mean, yeah. it was such a wonderful film. Absolutely. I, I loved watching it. And then finally, moving on to this is in regards to. Episode 218, TG Geeks episode 218. This is from Arkel. He says, that, um, well, he says, thanks for, thanks as always. They go cut that part? Okay, Cut fine. that part, yes. Wait, it's not cut, it's highlighted. I couldn't cut it. Oh, okay. It's talking about Discovery, then. Star Trek Discovery says, this is going to sound bolder than it actually is. 
but I think Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2 is the best Trek cliffhanger ending since Best of Both Worlds Part 1. Hmm. Keep in mind that when I say that, DS9 never had any cliffhanger season finales, Voyager only had four, and Enterprise only had two. And one of those, well, the episode as a whole was actually pretty good, but the very last scene, which was basically left behind as an F you for by the exiting showrunners to the new crew, would have to resolve it in season four, pretty much kill the show. Um, I will agree that, um, well, I'm not sure. I mean, wow, I thought the Discovery cliffhanger was really, really outstanding. Yeah. I, I, I would actually rate it as probably the best since uh, Best of Both Worlds Part 1. But, you know, then, you, you know, that different strokes for different folks. Then, closing off with uh, my review for the movie Enger- <laughs> Enger's Endgame. Oh, yeah, yeah. Enger's of Endgame. Yeah, Enger's of Endgame. <laughs> Avengers Endgame. Wow. Got a comment from Susan Martin Murph. She says, I'm going to need a case. I'm going to need to bring a case of tissues. Yes, you will. Because uh, there was a comment from uh, the people who attended the Purple Carpet uh, event that uh, everybody from Marvel was at. Uh, Chris Hemsworth said that he cried three times. Chris Evans said he cried six times. I mean, mm. and I came close to outright sobbing. Yeah, it, it's such there a powerful. Were a couple film. of times that I almost went. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, I, I was dangerously close. Oh my, dangerously was, close. Yeah. And by the way, as of um, I, I guess the the Russo brothers have said that as of today, meaning when this episode comes out, it um, spoilers galore. Um, the uh, embargo on no spo- no spoilers is now over. But. We won't but give. we'll be respectful. Yeah, I mean, for another week or so. Yeah, another week or so. But then, hey, all bets off, people. And then lastly, a comment from my old friend Julie Marshall. She says, can't wait to see it. Yeah. Um, so, And that's, that's our feedback for uh, today. Yeah, if you want to leave a comment on our Facebook page, you can do that. And because we publish everything to Facebook and all of the articles, episodes, etc. You can also comment on our YouTube episodes, which all of our uh, episodes are on YouTube, not our other content. You can find all of our other content on our Twitter uh, handles and as well as Instagram and on TGGeeks.com. And you could receive a future shout out on an episode. We also have a listener feedback line. If you're so inclined, you can call us and leave us a voicemail message and we'll play that on the episode. You can call 469 TG Geeks. That is 469 844 Three three five seven, and as always, please play, play nice. nice. Yeah, baby, they're like two gay geeks. They're together, you know. They're two gay guys, and they're geeks. Is that okay? So we attended something really interesting the uh, just a few nights ago. Yeah. Um, I will let uh, Keith talk about it. Well, it, it's the monthly meeting of IFP Phoenix, and IFP Phoenix is the Independent Feature Project Phoenix. Uh, they support and develop the growth of independent filmmaking in Arizona through education, networking, exhibition, and filmmaking opportunities. And their desire is to help connect everyone in the Arizona filmmaking community. They have a monthly meetup where uh, people are encouraged to bring uh, some of their film in whatever stage. Various it is, state of development. Various stage of, stages of development and get feedback from the audience and we attended that. We decided we wanted to become a little more plugged into the Arizona filmmaking community. And uh, the, by the way, IFP Phoenix is sponsored by uh, Phoenix Film Festival or Phoenix uh, Film Foundation. And uh, we went and saw a couple of really interesting pieces and gave some feedback and the directors. And, you know, we did some networking there as well. And it was really kind of I a, had a great neat time. little... Uh, Neat little get together and met lots. Of, I mean, there were probably what twenty five people, about twenty five people, something like that. And I saw some things there that really display some very promising talent. Yeah, I mean, there was some, uh, and it was across the board too. Yeah, in terms of what was there. 
Uh, I was I was largely pleased with the things we saw. I mean, yeah, there was some a lot of constructive criticism that was being um, presented by by everybody there, and yet um, I, I thought some of the some of the shorts that we saw were extremely powerful. Yeah, there was uh, from student filmmaker to a uh, short film to a, a, a project that was originally a forty eight hour film project, which. Uh, a 48 hour film project for anybody that doesn't know is they get together and in 48 hours, you have to go from concept to finished Finished product product, in 48 hours. And and that's a tough thing. I know a lot of people that have done that and they say it is very rewarding, but it will wear you out. Yeah. And you'll learn a lot too. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, plus, you know, a couple of other things that we saw. So it's, it's across the board of different types of films and, you know, projects that are in the works and, uh, they're, they're looking for feedback. Does the story work? Does it, you know, how is the, they obviously, if there's things that they don't necessarily want feedback on, or they know that are an issue like lighting or, you know, coloration or, you know, color correction, mm-hmm. those sound, those types of things, you know, they'll tell you up front and, you know, somebody may give them some tips on, on fixing those things. But uh, it's really kind of a networking opportunity for uh, filmmakers to get some feedback before they turn their babies loose in the world, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think we'll probably be doing I think that. I think we'll be doing so, that a lot more often. Yeah, because it it's nice to get in touch with the local filmmaking community here and be a part of that. So... Uh, If you have an opportunity to check out uh, Phoenix Film Foundation and all of the educational items that they do, there's all kinds of things, including IFP Phoenix and and many other things that they do. So check it out. Well, I would also recommend you, uh, if if you're not in the Phoenix area, uh, but you're in a major metropolitan area, you know, like Los Angeles or San Francisco, you might want to look around. You do some digging. You you never know if you're going to find the same kind of organization that exists in your part of the world. Yeah, exactly. There's, you know, the filmmaking communities, the independent filmmaking community is uh, in various places. So check it out. Yeah, ranging from just independent to to, uh, being, you know, attached to schools and universities. Exactly. So support independent creators as always. I'm Daniel Ratcliffe, and I believe that reaching out for help is the bravest thing a person can do. If you are struggling and need support, call the Trevor Lifeline at 1-866-488-488. 7386. It's free and confidential and trained counselors are there to listen 24-7 without judgment. To learn more about the Trevor Project's life-saving work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or questioning young people, go to thetrevorproject.org. If you are in transition or have already transitioned and are in crisis or you know of someone in crisis, there is a special hotline just for you. The hotline is provided by translifeline.org and staffed by specially trained counselors who are transgender themselves. The hotline in the U.S. is 877-565-8860. In Canada, it is 877-330-6366. Or you can go to the translifeline.org for more information about the important work they are doing. Please reach out for help. And now Ben's going to give us a rundown of what we ran this last week in yes. articles on the website, tggeeks.com. Yes, starting with Sunday, April 28th, Dr. Zombie, Monster Family Physician, number 46. We're approaching wow. one year. Yeah. One year with Tommy Cannon. And he has not missed a week. He's been awesome. Then on Monday, the 29th, we had episode number 219 of the TG Geeks webcast. On Tuesday, the 30th, Phoenix Fan Fusion presents Queen Lantern Core Drag Dravaganza. That's a mouthful. It's a new signature event for Phoenix Fan Fusion. And we might have something more yeah. to talk about that in the later, you know, down the road. Uh, then, uh, Cloak and Dagger Season 2, Compelling and Intense. That is Andrea's review of that series. And then, uh, trailer for 
Sonic the Hedgehog. It's just been released. Oh, oh my boy, gosh. That, that has created, has a, created mess. a mess. Yeah. That has just created oh the my biggest, gosh. hottest <laughs> mess. And I just read that the studio is saying, yeah, we're going to change the way Sonic looks. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Apparently, they don't like the feedback. Oh. And, yeah. And then uh, Wednesday, May 1st. Jeannie's Yaps, more restaurants on the road. This time she talks about Market on Houston in San Antonio, Texas. And then Aaron's Arcade of Words reviews the sequels issue number three, Van Helsing High School. Then on Thursday, the second, uh, my review of the movie The Falls, Testament of Love. This is the second film in a trilogy about uh, LDS slash LGBTQ plus. You know, so go with that. Uh, and then also, Coca-Con returns for second year for Labor Day weekend. Nice little press release there. Yeah. And then on Friday the 3rd, new sushi number 61, morsels of news from Japan and beyond. This is from Hamish Downey. And then Erin, she's got more Arcade more Awards. stuff. This time she's reviewing The Margins. And that's from Fan... Fan, uh, fan, fan based, based press. press. Yeah. I just could not get and that word out. I, I did a review, but Aaron's is much better than mine. Oh my gosh. This it's a great graphic novel. If you have an opportunity, go to fanbasepress.com uh, and look up the margins. It it's a great graphic novel. And then to close it all off, Saturday, May the fourth, be with you. Free comic book day and Star Wars Day collide, and that is all that we have yeah. for this week. Should I should I give the little intro that I did for the um, free or Star Wars or the oh that, might as well that article might yeah. as well why not let's see where did where to go there it is okay here we go. Twas a long time ago in a galaxy far far away. Longer now than it seems, in a place that perhaps that you've only seen in your dreams. For the story that you are about to be told began with the comic books of old. I know you're curious to see what's inside. It's what happens when two geek holidays collide. It's actually really clever. <laughs> but what I wonder is how many... Okay, okay, here, here's, Here, here's, here's a question Here it is, you. people. How many of you actually got that? How many recognize what that is from? Yes. Yeah. Leave feedback for us. I Comments. Should, I wonder if we should give them a prize if they get it. Yeah. Hey. Hey, we might as well make mention. You know, make hey, mention. We have a copy of Katie Edwards' The Last Son that you will get if you comment and you... Uh, we Well, let's put it this way. Comment or leave a comment on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or on the website, and we will gather those comments, and we will pick a winner for next week. Yes. And it, you will get a copy of Katie you, Edwards. It, assuming you guessed it right. Yeah, exactly. So you can find all this stuff that we talked about at tggeeks.com, as well as entries on our Facebook page. Please visit and comment. As always, we have our follow-up items. We're huge supporters of independent creators, as you could tell. Whether it's filmmakers, comic book artists, writers, or others, please buy their stuff. And if you are at a con, have cash for them. Please support independent creators. CocoCon returns for a second year Labor Day weekend at the Doubletree Hotel at Metro Center in Phoenix. Come on down and enjoy the folks and festivities. We will be there doing our popular concast as well as socializing. You can go to CocoCon, that's K C O K O C O N dot O R G for memberships and more information. E I E I O. Yeah, exactly. Fico Fiend wow. <laughs> Can I talk today? No, not at all. That was epic. Phoenix Fan Fusion is a couple of weeks away. In fact, it's Memorial Day weekend. Be sure to check out all the great guests and panels at phoenixfanfusion.com. We're going to be wandering around and covering the whole event. And we'll also be covering the new signature event, the Drag Stravaganza, on Friday night. Check out our article, and we'll have an interview with one of the folks at Square Egg Entertainment coming up soon. The Joshua Tree Feeding Program. The goal of Joshua Tree Feeding Program is to provide nourishment to low-income HIV-positive residents of Maricopa County. They provide balanced meals from the pantry, and it is a pantry where clients can go in and have the opportunity to choose what they want, just like a grocery store. Please consider supporting Joshua Tree either with a single gift or a monthly recurring gift. Go to JT. 
fp.org. Some special shout outs to some people that uh, are really kind to us with, with our content. First, you heard a little feedback from Arkle. That is Brian Weber. He has the Arkle Times Post Dispatch News, which does republish our content there, and we are grateful. You can find the Arkle Times Post Dispatch News by finding him on Twitter, and you can do that by searching at Arkle, A R K L E. And then there are some Facebook groups that we need to give shout outs to. First, Gay Geeks After Hours. Big thanks to the moderators for literally saying, share away. So we do. And their URL is facebook.com slash group slash Gay Geeks After Hours. And they do have a little um, secondary or subsidiary Facebook group called Gamers After Hours. And some of the stuff that um, Aaron, uh, you know, when she's doing her Aaron Arcade you know, game reviews, we will post stuff there as well. And they like to share. Also... The Gay Geek, for allowing us to share our stuff on their page. Their URL is facebook.com slash group slash the Gay Geek. And as always, our most heartfelt thanks to their moderator, Jeremiah Rees, for giving us his blessings to share our content there. Yes, thank you, Jeremiah. And lastly, we are now found on Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, as well as where other fine podcasts may be found. Also, check us out on Krypton Radio at 3 a.m. and 3 p- p- p.m. Wow. P- Pacific <laughs> Krypton up, Radio pisser. at 3 a.m. and 3 p.m. Pacific on Tuesdays and listen to their other content. They are a 24 hour geeky radio internet radio station. Please rate us and review us on iTunes and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Up next time, I, 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 I can't remember. Maybe the interview about the drag extravaganza or something else. But that one, I think, is uh, next week. So stay tuned for more. Okay, that should do it for this episode of TG Geeks Webcast. Be sure to check out the article for this webcast episode. We'll have several links on the page of things that we talked about. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website, tggeeks.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. From TG Squared Studios, I'm Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to comment and get and get in the line for the free copy of The Last Sun. Please be kind to yourself and those around you. Peace. Cheers. Cheers.